Good evening, praise be Jesus and Mary. This evening I have the pleasure of introducing Joseph Charles McKenzie. How do you do? He is the winner of the 2020 Society of Classical Poets competition and also winner of the Scottish International Open Poetry Competition. He has uh, great learning for the patrimony of literature in our Western culture, has a great love for poetry. He's a traditional Catholic lyric poet, so all his poems are very much inspired by the doctrines of the Catholic faith and informed by the scholastic philosophy and theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. He obtained a BA in Literae Humaniores, an MA in French studies, a minor in Italian, has taught English in a French lycée. He's a scholar in the history of Italian, Spanish, French, and the English sonnet, and is considered the foremost sonneteer of our age, which needs poet need someone in this realm of art in order to influence our society for the good, for the beautiful, and the true. He, before getting married, was considering becoming a priest, so he studied in France and then in Winona in the United States in the seminary, received the minor orders of porter, lector, exorcist, and acolyte, and then decided that well, that was not for him. and left and got married to his beautiful wife, who has been also the inspiraci, inspiratrix yes. of, of certain of your poems, especially in your book, Sonnets for Christ the King, uh, some of which have been set to music by Hall, what's his name? Yes. Uh, and um, your verses have appeared in New York Times, The Scotsman in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Independent in London, Spectator, the USA, and the Society of Classical Poets Journal, Trinacria, from New York, and other venues. I've known Joseph now for over five years, and I myself have had I'm a very a little try in poetry. It's not my forte at all, but I've very much enjoyed your first book, Lots for Christ the King, and today we'd like to talk about your second book, which I think even surpasses Sonnets for Christ the King, uh, your second book for the Blessed Virgin Mary, Sonnets for the Queen of Heaven. Would you uh, like to talk to us about this book and what inspired you to write it and what your goals are for this book? I'd love to, Father. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Uh, the Sonnets for the Queen of Heaven is the sequel to the Sonnets for Christ the King. And as James Sale uh, of the uh, Royal Society uh, in London uh, has stated, uh, numerologically speaking, the 70 sonnets, 77 sonnets of each collection uh, total uh, the number 154, which is the number of sonnets published uh, under the name of William Shakespeare in the 1609 edition of those sonnets. So the homage to Shakespeare, which Mr. Sale, who is himself a, 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 a very good English poet, uh, has indicated, uh, is, is an homage to the great bard. And we can't underestimate the influence that Shakespeare has had on English literature and studies. And those who have studied him closely know that yes. he was definitely a Catholic. Well, that, that's absolutely right, Father. No, we cannot, we absolutely cannot underestimate William Shakespeare, who was a recusant Catholic. He was a cousin of St. Robert Bothwell, who uh, was martyred by the uh, Protestant establishment. Elizabeth uh, the first. Uh, so we can, you and I, Father, cannot underestimate that influence of the greatest Catholic poet of the English language. However, and this is my fear, is that there are some within the traditional movement who can underestimate Shakespeare's influence and who can utterly discard Shakespeare's influence because they have no interest 
in the Catholic literary tradition. And I dare say, Father, that this was indeed one of my motives for reviving uh, Shakespeare's sonnet form to begin with. I've studied several Shakespeare's play, uh, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Macbeth, which is my favorite of the plays that I've studied, King Lear, um, As Much Ado About Nothing, what was the other one? Um, I forget now, but I've studied a number of his beforehand, being ignorant, I didn't think much about Shakespeare, but once you actually study him deeply, you realize he was bringing forth in a very subtle or not so subtle way, many Catholic truths in his plays and morality. Um, unfortunately, I have not really studied much of his sonnets. Well, ab absolutely. He, 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 and just for a shorthand, because, you know, we only have so much time, uh, the great uh, English scholar Joseph Pierce uh, had published two books which definitively uh, prove both through uh, intertextual means and extra uh, textual uh, means uh, that Shakespeare, there's absolutely no doubt that, that his, his works are Catholic and that he was Catholic. Now, what makes this very interesting is that uh, St. Robert Southwell, who was Shakespeare's cousin, as we say, we don't have any surviving communications of Southwell uh, and Shakespeare. We know that they did communicate, obviously, but those have not been handed down to us except for one thing, and that is the opening of uh, Robert Southwell's uh, St. Peter's Complaint in the, in the preface of it. Now, that's a collection of poems because Robert Southwell was a tremendous poet. Uh, and St. Peter's Complaint is very much worth reading today. Uh, although, uh, you know, no, no, no one, it seems like, in certain circles are going to dust, blow the dust off and read it. But he had actually, Father, he had... Um, uh, roundly chastised his cousin William Shakespeare for failing um, to use lyric poetry uh, for the glory of God. In that sense, he thought that Shakespeare had been remiss as a lyric poet. But in stating this chastisement in the, in the preface of his own collection, Robert Southwell makes a point uh, to all poets, all times, including our own, uh, that lyric poetry has a, a kind of definite divine purpose. Now, now, those who read my books, these two collections, understand from the very beginning that my thesis has always been, and still is, I have been persecuted for this, I have been thrown out of the usual, you know, little online line clicks and the like, because of this thesis. Namely, that traditional lyric poetry is a pure development of our divine and Catholic faith. It is a development of Catholic, within Catholic Christendom. It has its origins in Catholic Christendom. Uh, in the first English poet, whose name was Cademan, who was mentioned, by the Venerable Bede uh, as having written uh, the, the first uh, legitimate poetry uh, in uh, the, 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 the Saxon language. And um, from, from there it goes on, and even into the modern age. For those who are unfamiliar with the term lyric poetry, do you want to give a definition? Well, well yeah, yes, I will. What that is. Well, you know, it's very, it's very good because, of course, I, I think those of you who have seen Fathers YouTube video right now, which is viral, uh, on the three days of darkness. The thing that set that video apart was the mode of thinking, which proceeds by definitions uh, and the understanding of things by their causes. Uh, so if you want to understand lyric poetry properly, um, I can tell you very simply that in terms of, uh, of content, uh, it interweaves three very fundamental aspects of human experience. One of them is time, the other is death, and then the other is love. And if you've understood that, you've understood most of it. Now that will not make you a poet by any means or a lyric poet, but as a reader, if you understand 
those three elements going into reading anybody's verses, whether they be Tennyson or whether they be a very Catholic poet like Father Gerard Manley Hopkins, um, you will appreciate, you will taste, you will savor, uh, and you will above all enjoy and take pleasure in intellective and spiritual pleasure in poetry. Now, that, and I, I mentioned the pleasure because this is something which the modernists of, the, of the, that great minus sign of, of civilization, uh, the 20th century, this is what they've taken away from you. They've taken it away from you, and that's why you don't read poetry anymore. I, I would, yeah, I think a lot of people have unfortunately had a bad taste for poetry, probably they've been forced to read some vapid jingle of rhymes from some modernist or atheist in their high school days after Vatican II, perhaps in the 70s or 80s. So they have a distaste for poetry because poetry has unfortunately divorced itself from the lyricism of the tr death, life, love, and the passage of yes. time. Yes. And of course, divorced itself from true morals, uh, true good humanity, human love, and charity. and it might the words might sound nice the form might be okay but it's really lacking depth and substance which i cannot obviously <laughs> your your poems poems are very much the opposite your sonnets although you know just 14 verses are very uh, concise uh the forms are beautiful and the meanings are very deep theologically and the artistry of it I find very lofty as well and, and beautiful. So well, it, well, you've evoked the word truth, and in this sense, it, I'll just the audience on this question because actually, it was it was really by my association with Father Moylan and uh, uh, His Excellency uh, Bishop uh, Marcus Romola, who is a wonderful Bavarian bishop, uh, who is probably the most Mari Mariological bishop cleric I have ever known. I have a very long experience with traditional clerics. Um, so when I met Father Moylan and, and when we began to establish uh, mission masses here in our house, uh, it had the effect of inspiring me to uh, unite the talents that I had had in my previous life as a poet, which was extremely rich already, but to unite those gifts which were given me uh, to the true preachment of the Gospels that we were receiving from these wonderful, wonderful men. And uh, one of the singular things about uh, the sonnets for uh, the Queen of Heaven is that they are the only body, substantial body, of traditional lyric poetry, number one in our century, but number two, I must tell you that they, uh, this is the only collection that I know of in the 21st century that bears uh, the, both the imprimatur, which was granted by Father Moylan, and, well, the Nikhil Obstat was, I think, granted by Father Moylan, and then the imprimatur uh, by His Excellency uh, Bishop Rumola. Mm -hmm. and, that, that, and this is a very singular distinction. That's, of course, important when you write a book about someone as lofty as the Blessed Virgin Mary, the greatest creature that God ever created. It's important that, of course, the theology is right, since there are, of course, uh, among modernists and, of course, Protestants, very many heresies concerning the Blessed Virgin Mary, so having studied uh, a very beautiful course in very rich and deep in theology by Gregory Alastrue in the seminary. Uh, which Mr. Mole still uses to teach. He was a Spanish canon uh, in the early 1900s. His work just breathes great love for Our Lady, but sound theology according to the principles of St. Thomas Aquinas. And currently, in our day, we have to promote the reign and kingship of Christ through Our Lady. God came down to earth as a little boy through her, and he will come again and reign in the hearts of men through her intercession. What I found wonderful in, in Mackenzie's sonnets for the Queen of Heaven was the sound theology, you know, corresponding 
with all the sound theology of the Blessed Virgin Mary with her Immaculate Conception, Mediat Mediatrix of all Graces, Mother of God, etc., and very much in conformity with the theology that I studied on Our Lady and even you know, True Devotion to Our Lady by uh, Louis Grignan de Montfort. And in addition to that, too, also wonderfully corresponding with that great work on Our Lady by Venerable Maria of Agreda, who, of course, visited this wonderful land of New Mexico back when she bilocated in the 17th century. Yes, and, and, and we, I don't mean to interrupt, but we in New Mexico, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, a New Mexican Scot, if you will, by heritage. And we Nuevo Mexicanos have always read the Maria de Agredas biography of Our Lady, which is in four volumes entitled The Mystical City of God. So we, we are very much influenced by the spirituality of the Siglo de Oro, which was brought to our land by the Franciscans, who were our evangelizers. Mm -hmm. so, and so we are therefore highly Mariological. Now, my, my difficulty was that I very confident that I was utterly orthodox in writing the sonnets for uh, the Queen of Heaven, but that's not good enough. I find, and quite personally, Father, I take a very thin view of the uh, of these pundits, and we all know who they are. It really, doesn't matter to name them. But, but these men have nothing better to do than get on social media and then pontificate about this, this, and that. Nobody knows who gave them the authority to stand up and speak for the Church of Christ, which is a Catholic church. And so I, I wanted to buck that trend, and I wanted to make a point to all authors that, that really, when you have the luxury of perfectly orthodox clergy who are extremely devoted to Our Lady, and, and Our Lady not just as a mascot or a branding item for their little group or whatever, but when, when, when you see a true devotion, you have true clergy, well, why not submit your works to them? Why not ask them if this is correct, if this will be nourishing to the faithful, if, it, if this would be maybe harmful to the faithful? Um, is it something that, that is good? And if not, then we don't publish it. And that's what I did. And uh, um, I make no, um, I have no shame in doing that. It was an act of humility and devotion. But on the part of the clergy, it is also a, a, an act of, of clerical prudence, because surely it doesn't harm anybody to say, this is a book that's not going to harm Catholic faith, which is actually conducive to Catholic faith, which is actually edifying. What kind of harm? Could there possibly be in such a simple declaration, which is what the imprimatur simply is? It's not a complicated thing. You don't have to usurp a throne in order to make such a judgment. Right. Obviously, uh, having been spent how many years in the seminary? At least four, or was it six? Somewhere um, between there. You know, actually. you studied yes. theology, so you're well grounded in that. And then, having been in Paris in the Club du Poet, you have studied with masters of yes. poetry. Yes, and that's so, another affair, the, the Club des Poets. Yes. So I, you've, you've combined orthodoxy, the beautiful forms of the sonnet in here, with a great love. There's so much heart in these poems, and that's so important. Most faithful will not take out a, a huge volume book on Our Lady and read it cover to cover. Well, I don't see why not. But, because if, if you really look at, for example, it, so the... the, the the, the sonnet for the Queen of Heaven. It's a very interesting book because actually in, in conversation over dinner, we had some Buffalo Bourguignon this evening to celebrate uh, the Sunday in Epiphany. But in this conversation, Father, you actually stated that you thought the sonnets for the Queen of Heaven were actually superior to the sonnets for Christ the King in, as a collection. Yes, definitely. And I, 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 which I wonder if you'd like to state why that is. Or restate. Yes, certainly. Um, first of all, the cover is stunning, gorgeous. Uh, the painting by Velasquez. Yes. Of the coronation of Our Lady. And then you have the soft cover and the hard cover. So if you want to judge a book by the cover, this one you can. It's beautiful inside and out. Uh, Mackenzie takes the, the 49 invocations of the Blessed Virgin Mary from her litany, the litany of Loretto, and... To each one, he writes a sonnet. And then after that comes 
sonnets on major events in Our Lady's life, and the birth of Our Lord, the visitation. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a se sequence sequence that pertains to Christ's incarnation and its uh, consequence. And then at the end, you wrap it up very beautifully with the corona. Well, the, the and yes, the corona. Uh, just so you know, the, you may not know what a corona is. A, a corona is a form of sonnets which are linked by the last line of the couplet linked to the first line of the next sonnet. So they're, they're, they're what the French call enchaîné, but which what the English call corona. Now, the, the first English poet to write a legitimate, successful corona was actually John Donne uh, among the metaphysical uh, poets uh, of the Elizabethan period. And, uh, you know, this is a case where a lyric poet must really understand the history of his art, because uh, John Donne's corona is very personal, albeit very lyrical. Um, however, my corona was composed to crown the mother of God, uh, which added an extra, I dare say, level of responsibility and fear uh, to, to, to the endeavor. But, but the world really hasn't seen this kind of corona since Elizabethan time. There's been attempts among the foremost who just play with forms, and they're not really very too serious or meaningful. But I, I, I think, you know, it is a singular achievement. And, and even uh, the, the, the first sequence, which is, as Father says, uh, a sequence one sonnet for every title of Our Lady in the Litany of Loretta. That's not original, by the way. With me. That was done before. In was done Italian. before. Well, no, it was done before in English, in English. by a Carmelite uh, priest poet um, by the name of Edward Bradshaw or Bradshaw, and he had been uh, exiled. Uh, during the Reformation, he had gone off to Belgium and then to, to Rouen in France, and he had spent a good deal of time in those countries. He comes back um, to England. He is arrested. Um, he is sentenced by the anti-archbishop of Canterbury to death by hard labor in prison. Uh, he receives the intervention of some of his friends, which interestingly include the king of Spain whereupon he is released. He returns to Rouen and there publishes um, a sequence of sonnets on the then 44 titles of Our Lady. In, in, that was the, the length of the, the litany at that time. And so a lyric poet, I think this is something very important for, let's say, students of poetry in the Catholic schools to understand that a lyric poet must again, have a tremendous grasp of the history of his art. And, um, and you know, at clerics like, priests like Father Moylan and, and, and bishops like Bishop Ramola uh, are very, um, shall we say, engaged in historical research virtually all the time. History is a tremendous thing for our faith. Definitely. And that's what I loved about Mackenzie's books, his sonnets for Christ the King and for the Queen of Heaven. You know, he has an extensive background in theology and Catholic culture and history. Um, for instance, like Christmas Eve, when you talk about Jean Zobieski, a hero whom I love, and I love preaching about his victory over the Ottoman Turks at the gates of yes. Vienna. And then you talk, you, you bring that out when he's back to Krakow and he gives thanks to God for his victory. Things like that are talking about um, the Tower of Ivory, and you talk about the Virgin, the Virgin made of ivory. Oh yeah, well, the, yes, the Tower of Museum. yes. Now, Tower of Ivory is a, um, a very interesting thing, Father. It is called an ekphrasis, which is a, 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 a poem which is inspired by and descriptive of a. Objet d'art, or a painting, or, or some kind of work of art. And uh, uh, when I was in Paris, uh, poet in residence of the wonderful public poet, which was run by that 
by, by one uh, Jean-Pierre Ronet, a tremendous hero of the Résistance, uh, about whom I was writing a, a dissertation. And his lovely family, Marcel and Blaise, tremendous lovers of poetry. They're the, they're the first family of, of poetry in Paris. And, and they were very, very generous with me. Um, but it was there that I had, in, in Paris, where I saw an, a, a very important ivory of Our, uh, of our Lady, uh, Madonna and Child. Uh, the curvature of the statue reflected the fact that it was truly cut a segment of, of elephant tusk. And, um, and uh, so the whole thing is dentine. I, I evoke uh, walrus's mm. teeth and, and the narwhal's horn and all this. Um, so there's a tremendous variety uh, of ideas uh, which lyric poetry is capable of and, and which is peculiar to, to lyric poetry as well. So when you read it, it you're, you're kind of treated to a smorgasbord, to, to a, a grand board of ideas. Yes, from history, from theology, and also from points of view. It's not just first person or, or second person. They're not just old prayers. Sometimes he has taken, for instance, uh, I think a refuge of sinners, the view yes. of Dismas, the, the good thief on the cross. Yes. I really like that view when he's looking at Our Lady who's praying for him. It was an enigma at first reading that poem. I'm like, who, who's actually reciting this? Who's this person speaking? But as you got towards the end of the poem, it was like, oh, that was the good thief. And it was wonderfully bringing out how Our Lady was praying for the thieves. And yes, I, yes. I, 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 I'm, I, I don't have it in my memory because... Right now, my memory is consecrated to memorizing the sonnets for Christ for recitation, because I, I do recite, and we'll get back to that later, but would you like to hear it from, from my voice, the, the sonnet you're speaking of? That'd be wonderful, and I wanted to say, too, that correlates very much with what Venerable Mary of Agreda said at that point, uh, at the foot of the cross, Our Lady was indeed praying for the good thief, and he converted. Yeah, if we could hear you recite that, that would be wonderful. My Lord and King, Know that I do not know how, choked with gore, I now confess thy reign, or sense through all the streams of blood that flow across thy face, thy majesty so plain. Or how my noxious blood now cleanses me, where only ere I turn to thee its curse, had added torment to my cries, as we from our two crosses suffer, yet converse. For I, not knowing thee before this hour, repentant, baptized, pardoned, and absolved, feel consolation, like a summer shower, refreshing me, yet something's unresolved. That woman at thy feet, I saw her pray for me, that I see paradise this day. So yes, it, it's uh, what Father is re referring to is a, a kind of device of lyric poetry called the in persona. Uh, perspective, where one places, the, the poet places himself in the situation of his subject, in this case, the, the penitent thief. And of course, the cor cor correction, the connection to Maria de Agrinda is, is actually quite plain, and I'm glad that you evoked that, yes. Father. And what a pity, but Father, if I may dare say so, I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I don't mean to be too over, over, overly critical, but I have actually met <laughs> None of you are going to believe this at all. It's utterly scandalous. But I have actually had the misfortune of interacting uh, with priests who even, even wear a medal of Our Lady, uh, who actually uh, condemn uh, Maria de Agreda's great, great work. And it seems rather unfortunate. It's terribly unfortunate. Uh, Some of it's, I think, from ignorance and or misunderstanding I uh, hope to do a podcast on that later with Timothy Duff, the editor of the New English Edition of The Mystical City of God, and he will go into depth explaining that this book has never been condemned by the church. Yes. And 
many popes have promoted it, have read it, it has so many approbations from many popes. And those who actually read it, who have studied Marian theology, cannot come out with anything in that book that is contrary to faith or morals. And when you read the books, you cannot help but love Our Lady more and well, um, extol her greatness, which is beyond words. I actually had the, the great pleasure of hosting His Excellency Bishop Ramola in New Mexico, and we did go east of the Sandia Mountains, and we did visit the twin sites of Quaray, Quaray and Abu, where some of the most magnificent uh, Anastasi-style stone masonry churches uh, were built by the Humanos Indians who had interacted with Maria de Agreda. Now, Maria de Agreda is a, a veritable figure of New Mexico history. Uh, she is something that you read articles about in such things as the New Mexico Historical Review and other academic reviews. You just have to deal with her. But what's fascinating in the connection to my world of New Mexico is that, like I say, we were evangelized by the Franciscans, one of which was uh, Fray um, Al uh, Alonso de Benavides, who was the Custos of New Mexico, and who had been commissioned by the King of Spain to investigate how it was that Maria de Agreda instructed, converted and instructed these Humanos Indians so that when they met Fray Benavides for the first time, they, they petitioned for the sacrament. He was very shocked because it was the first time that a, a European had ever laid eyes on them. He later goes back to Spain, makes his investigation, tells the king that, yes, she, she was here, even though she never left her convent in Agreda. And, uh, and, and since then, by the way, this is a very interesting fact as well, uh, the kings of Spain subsequently uh, have used her little writing desk in her cell uh, to sign their official decrees. And it's the same desk on which uh, the mystical city of God was written by Sor Maria, by the way, whose body is incorrupt. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, fr from my point of view, it's very, very unfortunate. But it, 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 this is the thing about history, is that it can inspire. Poetry can be nourished by it. Po poetry draws it, 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 its power uh, and truth from, from wonderful, fantastic Catholic history, such as we have here in New Mexico. Without a doubt. Yeah, her... The miracle of Mary of Agreda's by location to to New Mexico or what is now Texas as well is is fascinating and a wonderful part of our history as Catholics, especially for those who are, who live in this most ancient civilized part of what's now North America. You know where you had a flourishing civilization before the Pilgrims came and landed in, in Plymouth Rock. And, and one, would, one would think that it worked as a mystical city of God, which was. Uh, authorized uh, for Catholic readers uh, for centuries. One would think that such a work, um, confirmed by the miraculous life of its authors, uh, would find far greater popularity among certain traditionalist groups, I suppose. But, you know, one, one could go on about that, I suppose. Yeah, it's really that's... not worth the time, is it? <laughs> you kind of almost have to give up on people like that. Well, that's that will be a subject eventually of another interview with Tim Duff that I have in planning. Well, I, and, and I do hope that includes the, the 28 articles of Don Garanger uh, defending, Possibly, um, defending Sor Maria's yes, work. work. Yes. That's a work in progress yes. as well. And Don Garanger, who's, who's uh, not nothing, shall we say. Uh, but, but the point of everything is, as Catholics, we have to, I say the same thing as with health. It has to be holistic, and that's a good word. Our faith is not divorced from culture. It's not divorced from history. Our souls are not divorced from our body. They go together. And uh, the influence of art for culture, for religion, good or bad, cannot be underestimated. If you think of mine right now, the horror, Taylor Swift, you know, not a moral person, doesn't have good moral music, but her influence is vast. A young billionaire... Yes. Young people flock in, in droves to her concerts, which are immoral and immodest. But you cannot underestimate the instrument. You cannot underestimate the influence that this young artist has. So as Catholics, we too should be in the realm of art and use it to uplift morals, to expose people to virtue, 
and to live better lives. And God has given Joseph Mackenzie this beautiful talent with poetry in which he wants to use, of course, to further the kingdom of God for the salvation of souls to the glory of Christ and his mother. Well, yes, and it goes back and it goes back a little bit this idea of influence. My example wouldn't have been Taylor Swift. My example would have been Robert Southwell's example, and that's William Shakespeare in his lyrical practice. Um, and and this is something this gets me to the subject of Catholic school educators, and we have some very fine ones throughout the country. They tend to be uh, women religious, but women religious who are extremely brilliant, mm. who are culturally very broad, who are, are cosmopolitan in their knowledge. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of the sisters of St. Thomas Aquinas in Brooksville, um, who are, I think, the envy of the world in terms of what they provide. What I'm saying is Shakespeare's the, the influence of Shakespeare's sonnets has been great uh, uh, until after my generation. It was very, very great. We all have to memorize at least three sonnets of Shakespeare. I still have some in memory. Um, however, as, you, as I grow older and one grows deeper in the faith, one goes back to South, Southwell's chastisement. Because what you have in, in Shakespeare's sonnets, you have a dark lady, you have some sort of illicit affair, with a dark lady who's, who's darker perhaps in more ways than one, and it's very insalubrious. And I know that Shakespeare was latching on to some sort of trend at the time, and, and he never should have. You have a, a, a fair youth, uh, and the relationship to the fair youth is so ambiguous that the, all the wrong people make all the wrong thing of it. Oh, yeah. And so what I'm saying is that that influence of those sonnets, I don't think is so great. I know I don't mean to be critical of art, um, but but then on the other hand, when it comes to the education of Catholic, uh, I can say that my sonnets repair um, the damage uh, that Shakespeare had done to this genre and to this form, which, which by the way he perfected the form. But 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 I repair that, and I'd like to speak about, if I may, a little bit about reparation and repair, because that father was my primary motivation for uh, for uh, the sonnets for the Queen of Heaven. Mm -hmm. My primary motivation was to repair for the blasphemies myriad against Our Lady, against our lady constant. And it, it's not just the outright blasphemies. I mean, it's, it's some of these priests who go around with Marian medals saying, well, you know, you don't, if you don't have a devotion to the rosary, you can just drop it. Uh, you know, where, 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 where congregations of, of, of so-called priestly religious who use Mary as a kind of marketing tool, but who don't really possess the devotion or Mariological knowledge. Or some clergy who lightly brush aside many private revelations, even ones that have been approved by the church as, well, not really necessary, um, in, in a very belittling way, which is very, I pointed that out in my Three Days of Darkness as well, is very unwise and I think very disrespectful of Blessed Virgin Mary. If she thought it was important enough to come down to heaven and tell someone a message for the world and make people pay attention with miracles, like Miraculous Spring or the Miracle of the Sun, for instance, or even smaller, being in Europe, there's so many smaller apparitions like um, Bereng or um, what was the other one in, in Belgium? Where she's the mother of the poor, so many little ones. Just she wants people to to listen to her, and I think clergy uh, do a, do her a great misdeed if they just brush that aside. We don't need that. We don't need that. Obviously, the faith comes first, the holy scriptures, and the teachings of the church. But when Our Lady appears, listen to her. She's your mother. She's the mother of Jesus. She came down from heaven. And the great well, and see the other thing about that is, for example. There's a way in which Our Lady has had has a, has had a direct influence on lyric poetry, Be, and I'm thinking here's just one example. I'm thinking of the, the troubadour of the Pays Occitan in the south of France during the Middle Ages. I'm thinking of the trouvère uh, of of Normandy and La Bretagne in the north, and, the, and of course the troubadours there were women. Troubadours as well. Now, during the Albigensian crisis, uh, they had become very paganized 
in their poetry. And they had been the bad boys of poetry. They, they were the Lord Byrons uh, running around very vulgar subjects, particularly pertaining to women, drunkenness and the like. They were, they, you know, some of them were Bachelier returning from the Crusades and had, had learned all the wrong things from the people that they were fighting. When uh, St. Dominic introduces the rosary to overcome uh, the Albigensian heresy, um, suddenly Our Lady in the south of France, uh, in, in, in the regions of Provence, uh, find in her a contrast to the kind of heathenism that the troubadours had introduced and the Albigensian had introduced. She had the direct effect of softening their language and of opening their poetic hearts to her beauty. And there was a transitional period in which um, it was very difficult to distinguish under the influence of the rosary. Uh, the poets, the troubadours love of a beautiful earthly woman and the love of the Blessed Virgin, that the, the beauty of the two were, were suddenly conflated before, before the, the final uh, ascent uh, that, to Our Lady that took place in the later stages of the, of the old Hubad or poetry. Uh, you had fabulous women very devoted to Our Lady, such as uh, Marguerite de Champagne, who was married to a, a troubadour poet, Thibault de Champagne. She and her husband Thibault, who had come back from the Crusades, had, had deliberately and very consciously undertaken the project of promoting uh, the moral code of la croquoisie, of what we call chivalry, mm. through uh, a, a poet by the name of Chrétien de Troyes, who created the Arthurian legends. The, the, the fact that Our Lady it was the most influential element in the transition of uh, medieval poetry from a, 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 a pagan tendency to a sublime uh, Gothic um, sort of filigree, uh, pristine loveliness, the, the fact that she had a direct literary effect on the world, because, because of course those Arthurian legends would then be... Uh, disseminated throughout the entire world, and particularly England, but also in Germany, with the Meister singers went through the same thing. So, uh, I mean, this, this is, um, and, and then I'm, I, I continue. In fact, there, there is a poem that is borrowed from one of the Arthurian poems, uh, and it's a, a Breton author, and it's, it's one of the sonnets, and it's about uh, Joseph of Arimathea uh, taking receiving the chalice from Pilate and catching the blood, etc. A lyric poet must know Old French, must know Middle French, must Latin. know these Latin and must know these histories. I am not, I'm not trying to boast or anything like that. I'm just trying to, for the sake of young people in the Catholic schools, let them be aware of the richesse uh, that poetry has to offer. It, it, it will take your breath away. And it'll be far more interesting than whatever is on the screen because your nuns are very lovely. They're very educated women. You love them. You respect them. You fear them. And that's all lovely. But then you're out in, in the big bad world. And then what are you going to do? Well, if you have a book to carry around, just like young students in the universities in the 19th century, they carried around Baudelaire. You, you, every generation should have a poet to carry around. That is my hope for this book. I hope uh, not only viewers of this, but people who found you find you online, uh, especially teachers in schools or homeschooling mothers, fathers as well, will pick up this book and introduce beautiful lyric poetry and sonnets to their children. And you have everything in here, really. You have sound theology, the beautiful poetic form. You have a great love for Our Lady. You have bits of history and Catholic culture. So it's not just not just plain old poetry, maybe from about nature or from a Protestant standpoint, or just some vapid modernist 
mere rhyme and rhythm, you have really elements of everything in this. And I really hope that uh, parents, teachers will pick up this book, will make it available in their bookstores because we have to fight against this modernist culture, right? We yes. Have to well, the influence for good. Well, the modernist, the modernist destroyed your interest in poetry for the past hundred years. You have been utterly disinterested in poetry. Mm-hmm. You haven't purchased any. The publishers can't sell it to you because you associate it with the emptiness of what the modernist modernist created. And and one of the unfortunate things I think of T. S. Eliot and, and W. H. Alden. These were early modernist intellectualizers of poetry. They really didn't get it. They were they were very elitist. Uh, the 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 letters of J. Alfred Pufa. Those are a satire on poetry's former audience, which is you and me. That is a satire, which is which degrades the common man. And I'm a common man. And I tell you that a poet must be a common man. A poet cannot stand above his audience. A poet must stand with his, with his feet firmly planted on the earth among his fellow men. How can you speak to your... A poet must speak to all mankind. How can you speak to all mankind if you have such a a denigrating idea of humankind. And that's the, the other problem with these modernists. They use opaque, recondite language that nobody understands, and they don't care to make it understood. That's also what I want to say, too. Don't be daunted, because I think if you read it slowly and carefully once or twice, it's not highfalutin mumble-jumbo. When you look at it, it's it's deep, but not not so lofty as to not be able to be understood by anyone who has a basic uh, good education in English literature and reading. They can understand these poems. There might be a few words that they don't know. Well, bust out a dictionary and look them up. Um, I would tell the audiences, don't be daunted. You don't have to be a student of poetry. You don't have to be a great scholar in English literature or writing or composition. But the poems are are understandable. And literally, the only thing you need is a human heart and a human mind. That's all you need. My, my, it's been said that, that I'm in competition with Shakespeare. I know. Shakespeare has been my master. I wrote another sequence of 154 sonnets in, 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 when I was young, and I received the Scottish International Poetry Prize for that. I went to Scotland. I received it. I interacted with all the great Scot- poets of the modern Scottish Renaissance who were wonderful. And um, uh, what I'm saying is Shakespeare created a form and a manner of writing the sonnet um, which was suitable to everyone in his audience in the Globe Theatre. He had groundlings who were largely uh, not very lettered people, but he had nobles, royals even, sitting in the mezzanine of the Globe Theatre and in the loggias. Um, so he wanted a form, he wanted a rhyme scheme and a mannerism that would appeal to virtually everyone. And, and a poet must appeal to everyone. Um, I'm also, I, I'm also my, my big battle my father is that poetry is to be recited by memory. If you do not seat poetry in the memory, then you have no business um, presenting it to the public. Uh, you don't possess a poem until you have it in your memory and can recite it by memory. Um, a poem is not published until it is recorded by a voice. The, the voice is the terminus of the publication of a poem. So there's an audio book as well, which you can find at MackenzieLyricPoetry.com. And it's a recording by a northern British actor who had some experience in the Scottish theatre as well, by the name of Ian Russell. And he won the Voice Award, was it last year or two years ago? Yeah, he won the 2020 uh, One Voice Award uh, Best Male UK United Kingdom Voice. Now, the One Voice Awards are the Oscars, the Academy Awards of the voice acting industry. And uh, he... Uh, was very enthusiastic about recording songs for Christ the King. And um, so uh, these are not, you know, this is not little cheesy devotional poetry by some amateur. And if they were, Ian Russell never would have consented to 
to record them because he's extremely picky when it comes to lyric verse. But so I'm recording these things, I'm reciting these things. And and by the way, Father, I'm not parochial. I love all clerics, uh, whatever their imperfections. They love me for, for even with my imperfections. I'm capable of reciting at any of your schools, um, any of your conferences. It really doesn't matter. Yes, yes, I suppose I'm critical, but who cares? Uh, Catholics have always been critical. Uh, hopefully, we still are. But I, I, I'm not parochial. I don't. Now, I love Father Moylan. I love Bishop Ramola. Um, but I, 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 I tend to love all clerics. I'm not. You know, it really doesn't matter to me. What matters is that I don't keep the gift that God has given me to myself. And in fact, I say that in one of the sonnets, by the way, that I that I had regretted for a time that I had put that gift aside. And right now you need to use your gift. And we watched last night. I really enjoyed the movie. I, I heard the bells about um, Henry Wordsworth Longfellow yes. and his struggle to uh, write poetry again after the tragic death of his wife and trying to save his, his son from the horrors of the American Civil War. Uh, I thought it was an excellent movie. And it really um, uplifted the poet and showed his great influence. Um, which, you know, for our country, Longfellow was, was a, a very great influence. Well, not only for, for our country, but also if you go to Westminster Abbey, you'll see that he's the only American poet who has a monument in Poet's Corner in Westminster Abbey. Now think about Poet's Corner. Chaucer has a monument there. Shakespeare, they all do. Tennyson, uh, the English revered Longfellow. And, and the, the, the poem that the movie that we saw is based on is actually a Christmas carol. Um, but it demonstrates, clearly demonstrates, the, the thesis that uh, traditional lyric poetry is a ray of sublime radiance emanating from divine and Catholic faith. And truly Longfellow's career uh, brought him closer and closer and closer to divine Catholic faith because he ended his life translating the, the most Difficult, potential siglo de oro Spanish Catholic poets you could possibly imagine. We can take any any poet who wasn't necessarily Catholic. Take Christina Rossetti. Take uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Take any of the poets of the Oxford movement. Uh, they, they 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 were were Catholic in their understanding of lyric verse. Uh, they were strongly influenced by Catholic poets. And there were many great ones. Coventry Patmore, for example, was a very, a very devout Catholic. Aubrey de Vere, the, the Irish uh, Catholic poet. These were poets that were beloved by Queen Victoria. But we and, have... and we need to know them. And, I, and Catholic educators need to talk to me about how we can make our Catholic literary heritage better known. Right. I, um... For instance, my brother, I helped him get through uh, high school with Our Lady of Victory. There was a lot of literature, a lot of reading, but besides The Lord of the Rings, which does, which does have a lot of poems in there by Tolkien, there were, I don't think in the course there was anything with poetry. I would love to see sonnets for the Queen of Heaven added to their bookstore or added to their curriculum in high school and the sonnets for Christ the King because Mackenzie here, Joseph Mackenzie, I believe he should be the the poet, the books popularly, the voice of the people of the traditional Catholic world. He's fighting against modernism. He's fighting against. I'm also the, fight, I, I'm also fighting against parochialism, which is just as bad as modernism. Parochialism is is a sort of thing that you you can't you can't use the brain that God gave you unless you go to permission, unless you ask the rector for permission, and unless you ask the rector of your parish for permission. But that. That, that's not how Catholics were formed, traditionally speaking. You shouldn't have to ask the rector of your parochia to read works that critics mm -hmm. say is great poetry by a great poet. If Chesterton were alive today, you wouldn't read him either because, oh, he could be dangerous or, he, you know, he doesn't have an imprimatur or my, the rector of my parochia uh, says, you know, these things could be dangerous. Poetry is not dangerous. Good Catholic uh, or, or Catholic-inspired 
uh, lyric poetry is n none of that is dangerous. Maybe just dangerous. If, if, you, if you truly possess faith. Maybe just dangerous to the kingdom of the modernist. <laughs> yes. And the narrow-minded. Yes, 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 exactly. I, 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 most Catholics have enough faith to appreciate um, truth wherever it occurs within the lyrical tradition. I mean, when, when I think, well, I mean, you've mentioned Longfellow. I mean, the, just think about it. Everybody knows that the Christmas carol, um, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Well, it was, it was a poem written on Christmas Day of 1863. And I mean to say, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, good will to men. Well, how can the, the fact that Longfellow at that point in 1863 had not fully um, uh, uh, engaged with, with, with Catholicism still the words repeat of peace on earth, good will to men. How could that be? How could peace on earth, good will to men be, be remotely dangerous uh, to Catholic faith? Uh, we Catholics, remember, we are the primary masters and we were always the primary stewards of human arts and letters. Um, and I, I hope we shall still be. Holy Mother, the church is the portrait of, of true art, of, of what's good and beautiful. She doesn't just destroy. She'll take something that has even a pagan temple or a mosque, and she won't just raise it to the ground. She'll be like, let's reconsecrate it. Let's cast out the idols, and we'll use it as a Catholic church. Oh, should we tear let's down the building of the Vatican in Rome because of all the um, Roman architectural elements? To include the dome, I and mean, should we tear that down because it, uh, humanists might have been involved that in would, its architecture? That would be a, a crime. Should, should we take sure. the sibyls out of the uh, sequence diacere in the requiem mass? Mm -hmm. uh, it, please. For the viewers, I'm going to put descriptions or links in in the description of this video, so you can acquire your own copy and hopefully copies for your friends or your children of the Sonnets for the Queen of Heaven by Joseph Charles Mackenzie, Sonnets for Christ the King as well, the link to some of the videos that have been produced on his uh, poems. Let's strive to further the kingdom of Christ through the kingdom of Mary, through her love. When we go to Mary, we cannot help but then go to Christ because she always leads her devotees to her son Christ. And let us try to be the light of the world in this dark time, not to fall under discouragement, not to just crawl into our little caves and our little homes, but to be the light of the world, to show the world that true Catholic art isn't dead, but we're going to fight and we're going to, to be the light and try to influence through many ways, but of course, through the powerful means of Catholic art to further the kingship of Christ so we can see his reign on earth and of course then forever in heaven. Thank you, Father. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. Thank you, Father. For the podcast. And may we be able to further the reign of Christ through Mary and one book at a time. God bless you.